A very, very warm welcome to this year's round of regional meetings. Uh, I'm Paul Surridge and it's my pleasure to uh, both introduce our speakers this evening and indeed give a, about a 30 minute presentation uh, for myself. That's the programme this evening. So you've got me for about 30 minutes, followed by Paul Clare, who's Director of OptiCommerce. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, didn't we see him last year? And you'd be absolutely right, you did. But we've invited him back because digital technology, digital marketing is moving on at a pace and we feel we need to have a refresh. So Paul is back here uh, this evening. Uh, Gary Haas is Deputy Chairman of Sitecare and is a practitioner, is a shareholder in Sitecare as you are. And he'll be giving his thoughts too on what he does in his practice from a marketing perspective. We'll then have a workshop and then any questions and we should see you out of here no later, I promise and about two o'clock this morning. So thanks to our sponsors, Marshon, ClearLab and OptiCommerce. Thank you very much indeed, much appreciate that. So a few housekeeping notes very quickly. You have a sponsor pack on your chairs. Be very grateful if at some point during the evening or uh, when you get back to home or practice, if you take a look through the, uh, the packs, lots of interesting information for you. If you find the room too hot or too cold, let us know and we'll see what we can do about that. Fire exit is over there. There are no tests planned this evening, so if the alarm does go off, then we do need to leave the room. Now, the PowerPoint presentations that you'll see this evening are available for you if you would like them. All you do is info at sitecare.co.uk and request the PowerPoint, and um, we will send them to you. Equally, as you probably gathered, um, uh, courtesy of Paul Clare at OptiCommerce, we're video recording this evening's uh, presentation, so. Uh, we'll probably be sending out video links to all of those people attending so that if you chose to, you could have another look at them or indeed use them for training. SC Dialogue, if you enjoy this evening, if you think it's worthwhile, then we'd be very grateful if you go on Dialogue and just put a message up to encourage other Sitekin members to attend the last two meetings that we've got planned, which is in Exeter and Bristol. Parking, um, parking, I think we sent everyone a note saying that parking was going to be £7.50, I just want to let you know the generosity of the Board of Site Care have agreed that you don't have to pay anything. We'll give you a little uh, ticket so you can go straight out. You don't have to pay for your ticket. And finally, mobile phones. I'd be very grateful if you can turn them off or put them on silent for the evening. Thanks for that. So we're here this evening to talk about marketing, collaborative marketing. So what is marketing? Well, the definition by the Chartered Institute of Marketing is the management process responsible for identifying anticipating and satisfying customer requirements profitably. And of course, the most important word there is what? Profitably, because there's no point in doing all of this stuff if you can't make a profit. So marketing is really about you, your brand, about everything that goes in your practice. So it's not just about selling. People often say to me, Paul, isn't marketing selling? Isn't it just uh, advertising? It's not. It's everything you do, say, communicate to your patients, prospective patients, uh, every day of the week, 365 days a year. That is marketing. Everything you do, everything you say, everything you communicate. So think about your brand, rhetorical question, but as you're sitting there now, just think for a moment about your brand. What does it say about you? What does it say about your practice, your service, the levels of service you provide? Your status in the local community, because I often say to our members, you know, you're not marketing your business to the whole country. You're marketing your business to a local community. How involved, how engaged are you with your local community? What would you like it to say? If you can sit there now and think, yes, this is our brand and you can put that into words, is that really where you want to be in the future? Or do you need to be somewhere else? Do you need to present yourself in a different way? And if so, what, what is the message you're communicating? So I believe your brand determines why people choose you rather than others. It's a statement. Who are you? What are you? Why should people come to you? Are you the red umbrella in a sea of blue umbrellas? Now last year, and we always end up talking about Specsavers, but last year Specsavers spent £35 million in the UK alone, and they're an international company as you know, £35 million in uh, above and below the line advertising, promotion, PR, etc, etc. 
And people often say to me, what, why? Why do they spend all that money? Everyone knows spec savers. And of course, everyone does know spec savers, but they don't do it to, to increase their brand share necessarily, their market share necessarily. They do it to maintain, to protect their brand and protect their market share. That's why they spend that money. That's why they're on television all the time. They're on radio, in the national newspapers, local newspapers. Wherever you go, you see spec savers. And I have to say, they're very clever. I used to run an advertising agency in London many years ago, and uh, spec savers didn't exist in those days. As you know, I'm a very old man. But in those days, um, if spec savers had walked through the door, we would have loved to have had that account. They, they do some very, very good, clever advertising. And of course, the end result is that they also help promote us in, in the independent sector. We'd rather they didn't exist, but they do. And uh, there we are. So they're there to promote and protect their brand. How many of you are familiar with Glasses Direct? How many of you have seen their adver adverts on television recently? Now, this is a company I went to see three or four years ago when they first started. Might even be longer ago than that now. There was someone who was working in there who tipped me the wink and said, come, come and have a look at what this company is doing. And Glasses Direct um, started out in Swindon and they had uh, an office block and a little bit of a warehouse. And they were processing in those days, and they'd only been going some months, they were processing 40 orders a day. 40 orders a day. I went back a few months ago to have a look at the operation. They were employing hundreds of people. Can anyone guess how many orders they're processing a day? Anyone like to guess? 4,000, no, not quite. 1,200 orders a day. That's a lot of business. All of these companies are coming in to nibble away at our market share. Online companies, you know, it's all, all coming toward us. And the question is, what are we doing about it? What are we doing to differentiate our model? And we come on to that in a moment. But they are saying to consumers, yes, come to us. We will send you, you choose half a dozen frames, we'll put them in a box, we'll send them to you at our cost, you don't have to pay for it, choose the frame you like, send them all back to us and we'll pay the cost and you can order your frames starting price at £25 single vision. Now so to some people that's a very compelling offer, very compelling offer. I'm certainly not standing here today suggesting that you do that. But what I am saying is we've got to be aware of what's out there, what the competition is doing, and be able to justify what we do in our brand, within our brand. So what did you do last year? But more importantly, what will you do in the year ahead to raise your profile in your local community? And which category applies to you? Now, are you someone who makes things happen? Do you actually, are you an innovator? Do you think, yes, I'm going to change this, I'm going to do that? Do you make things happen? Or someone who thinks they make things happen, and you've probably seen this before, someone who watches things happen, someone who wonders what happened, someone who didn't know anything had happened. <laughs> and I sincerely hope we don't fall into this category here. We've got to be mindful, we've got to be conscious, that's the word, conscious of what's going on every day in our practice but not just in the practice, but in a wider context. What are the competition doing? What's happening in our local community that we ought to be engaging with and doing? How can we become more visible? That's the word. How can we become more visible in our local communities? And be honest, and again, another rhetorical question, but are you thriving? Are you sitting there now thinking, yes, we've got a thriving business. We're constantly improving, constantly moving our business on. We're in control of our business. Or are you surviving, just getting by without much effort? <coughs> not investing much in technology, not investing much in digital marketing, which we're going to be hearing about later. Just getting by. We're, I'm earning a living. You know, it's OK. I don't have to do much. Or are you dying, struggling to keep up? Are you every day coming in dreading the prospect of an empty uh, diary? I do believe if you fall into either of those categories, you do really need to sit down and say, OK, what are we going to do? How are we going to move this forward? And your members of Sitecare, most of you are members of Sitecare. If you're not, I urge you to join us. Of course, I'm going to say that. 
But if you're members of Site Care, ask us for help. That's why we're here. Don't be an isolationist. Don't be on your own, in your practicing, in your practice, wondering what the future holds in store. Let us help you. Woody Allen once said, 80% of success is just showing up. And some of you who have been in business for a long time, in, in, in practice for a long time, will know that when you first qualified, you could put your name above a door, almost any door, and you could earn a living. You didn't have to do anything. You just saw patients and you earned a living. It's not like that anymore. What do we want from our business in the future? Or if you've got a partner, sit down with a partner and say, what do we want from our business in the future? Do you want more patients? Most people would say yes, and you certainly should be aiming for at least 10% uh, new patients every year. Do you want fewer patients? Now, that might sound an odd question to ask, but in Scotland, with a Scottish contract, they want fewer patients. They don't want to see all these people, necessarily. They can't cope with it. Wonderful position to be in, you'd think, but some of them are still struggling and not necessarily doing very well. Do you want different types of patients? Now, that's an interesting one. You know, do you want to see younger people? And the question there is, so what are you doing to attract younger people? Do you want to see more older people? Now, most practices I talk to, they say that about 85% of their patients are GOS patients. Probably 10, 15% private patients. That seems to be about an average independent. But if you want more younger people, if you want people between you know, 18 and 35 or 25 and 45, then you've got to target. You've got to focus on those people and you've got to be able to ask yourself the question, what are we doing to attract them? Do you want more eye exams, fewer eye exams, more dispensing, improved conversion rates, higher value dispensing? There are answers to all of these uh, questions, if indeed they are questions. There are answers to all of these, and we can certainly help and guide you if you need help and guidance. And on contact lens sales, some of the contact lens companies would argue that independence, about 30% of their turnover, 30, 35% of their turnover should be attributed to contact lens sales and aftercare. Now, I think that's probably a little bit high, um, but I do think most independents do not make the most of contact lens sales and aftercare. I think there's a big gap there. And there are four lovely words. Oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. So when you've got a patient in the chair and you've finished an eye exam, just say, oh, by the way, would you like to know if you're suitable for contact lenses? Now, you certainly don't want to ask people, would they like to try them? No one wants to put glass in their eye, because that's what people think. People don't understand that they're so malleable, that the, the, the materials that are used today, they're easy to wear, they're comfortable to wear. They don't realise. So if you say, do you want to try them? No, I don't want to try them. Do you want to know if you're suitable? Well, yes, I want to know if I'm suitable. Leads to contact lens trials. And the other, oh, by the way, and of course it sounds as though it's the first time you've ever said it, oh, by the way, if you've got family or friends that you could recommend to us, we'd be really grateful. That's all you have to say. And you'd be surprised the number of new patients that walk through the door. So whatever you want, I do believe, and I say this every single year, I do believe whatever you want, you have a greater chance of achieving your aims, your objectives, if you have a plan. And I won't ask you to put your hands up, but not many people that I speak to have a plan for their business. And I'm not talking about a 60 page document with pie charts and all kinds of uh, research. I'm talking about a statement of intent. It could be a one page A4 statement of intent that simply says next year we want to increase our turnover from say 300,000 to 330,000. Or we want to uh, increase the number of patients by X. Whatever your statement of intent is, you then need to be able to say, well, OK, what do we have to do to achieve that? If it is a 30,000 increase in turnover, is it going to come from existing patients or new patients? And the likelihood is going to come from both. But you need to be able to say, where is, where is it going to come from? You need to look at dispensing uh, 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 values and say, well, OK, roughly how many new dispensers have we got to process through the business to achieve that objective? And then, of course, the key is, well, how are we going to attract those patients? What are we going to do in our marketing PR promotion to make that work. And then you need budgets. I mean, again, most independents, they get their end of year accounts, they look at them and say, oh, we made a better profit than we did last year, or we made less profit than we made last year, and they put it on a shelf. And of course, end of year accounts are an historical do document. They are the past. 
You cannot change the past. Impossible to change the past. You can't change what happened yesterday. So you've got your set of accounts, they go on the shelf. You can't change that. But if you have a budget at the beginning of your financial year, and out of that budget, you can set management accounts, monthly or quarterly management accounts. If you get to the end of a, a month or the end of a quarter, you can reflect and say, well, where are we in the cycle? Are we ahead of target or behind target? If we're behind target, what do we need to do in the next quarter to catch up? What do we need to do to increase our business to make sure that we're aiming towards our end of year goal? To me, that makes sense. And I often talk about ships and rudders. You have a ship leaving London, going to New York, a year out, a day out at sea, rather not a year out, a day out at sea, and suddenly it loses its rudder. What is the chance of that ship arriving in New York? I would suggest it's minimal. To me, the rudder is the plan. The, the, the rudder drives you toward your goal, toward your plan. Now, without a plan, without a, the rudder, how do you know when you've achieved your objective? How do you know what your objective is? So I do believe that there's an, an opportunity here for everyone in this room to actually set plans, set um, budgets, and then run with management accounts and be able to check on those management accounts. But that's only my view. So year-on-year -year business success in, is not, in my view, determined by your clinical expertise, patient care and products. <coughs> It's determined by your ability to set and achieve business and financial goals and market your clinical expertise, patient care and products. And I know, as I said, it, historically independents have not been very good at this stuff, but I do think that if you make the effort, if you ask the questions, and not just of me and, and, and Psychcare, but on SC Dialogue, for those of you who are on our email forum, great opportunity to say, well, okay, what do you do? practitioners out there that are on dialogue. How do you plan? Get some advice and, and, and run with it. So we're told the recession is over, the feel-good factor is returning, but I don't believe business growth is a given. I do think it's about hearts and minds, and I love this quote here that pockets, pockets, are the most sensitive <coughs> part of a human being. That's why we need to touch hearts and minds first. And of course, as independents, we're very good. At, at doing that, aren't we? We're very good at touching hearts and, uh, and minds. So a few activities and actions. <clears throat> establish a plan, budget, and establish management accounts. Allocate marketing budget. I do think it ought to be about 8% of your turnover. So whatever your turnover is currently, when you get to your next financial year, if you are going to plan, if you are going to budget, set, set uh, goals, then I would think somewhere around 8% of your turnover should be attributed to the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about this evening. If you're advertising in local newspapers, I wouldn't do it. It is a waste of money. Although I do have occasional practitioners say to me, Paul, that's not good advice because we do it. We spend £300 a week or a month or whatever on advertising in local newspaper and we do very well, thank you very much. How can I argue against that? But generally speaking, it doesn't work. Distribute regular press releases to the local media. I do believe PR works. People tend to believe PR rather than they believe advertising. <coughs> Invest in online and social media, and I put that in red, partly because we're going to be talking about this a little later, but because I really absolutely, unequivocally believe this is the future. Radio stations, TV stations. When was the last time you approached a radio station and said, look, I'm an optometrist. You know, I, I'm not suggesting I've got all the answers, but, you know, I'm an optometrist. I could advise your listeners on eye care. Would you like to do a phone-in show? And I promise you, if you can do a phone-in show with a radio station, they'll invariably want you to do it on a regular basis. And secondly, those people listening to that radio show will want to come to see you. It's a great way of attracting new patients. What about balloons? Branded balloons, a simple idea and so cost-effective. Balloons are about a penny each with your logo on. And the idea is that you buy a pump. You certainly don't want to blow them up individually. You buy a pump, okay, and you blow up loads of balloons. And once a fortnight, go out on a Friday or Saturday, get a couple of teenagers, responsible kids who may be aspiring actors and actresses, get them to go out and hand them out to families and to children with a little card about your practice and encourage them to come to the practice. Kids love balloons, and they're very, very visible. Well, you know, you've seen them, I'm sure. So you've got a couple of kids with loads of balloons handing them out, and on the day you do this, 
put lots of balloons hanging out of the window or the door of the practice so that people can identify with you. It's so cost effective. And it is all about visibility. Newsletters, brochures, I've always encouraged practices to, to brochure door to door. It doesn't work for everyone, I have to say. It doesn't work and it can be quite expensive, but it does work very effectively for some practices. I'm not going to cover these other areas because these are, to a large extent, going to be covered in uh, Gary's presentation towards the end. So hypothetically, a competitor, chain or independent, <coughs> opens up opposite your practice. You've got some options here. What do you do? Do you panic and think the world will come to an end? Immediately offer free eye exams and discounts? Bemoan the intruder to staff and patients? You know, moan about this new practice that's opening? Put the practice on the market or run full page ads in the local media? No, there are other things to do. Do you welcome the new arrival, <coughs> albeit with gritted teeth? Do you go across and introduce yourselves to them? Discover more about their plans and target audience? Do you review your current business plan and financial plans? Conduct a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of your practice? Do you smarten the practice up? Do you make it look nicer, more engaging? Invest more in staff training, invest in new equipment, etc., etc. That's what we ought to be doing before they arrive. This is stuff that we ought to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I'm personally optimistic about the prospects for the majority of Psycho members. Not all, but the majority. But I'm less optimistic about the independent sector as a whole if we fast forward, you know, eight to ten years or so. I believe that at the moment there's about two and a half thousand full-time independent practices a thousand part-time practices in the UK and when I joined Psychcare 18 years ago there were 5,000 independents in the, in, the, in the market. I believe within five, eight to ten years we could be down to 1,500 full-time practices but as I say there it doesn't have to be that way. I do believe if we start doing the kind of stuff that we're talking about this evening, setting goals, setting plans, doing the digital marketing and all the other stuff that you're going to hear from Gary, some fantastic ideas from him, then I think we can we can slow this decline. But I think there are far too many independents out there that are not doing all the right things. And I would urge you, if you know people that are not, for example, members of Sitecare, encourage them to join. Encourage them to get involved in the debate. Get involved in the future of the independent sector because it's not just you and your practice. It's about the independent sector. We need critical mass. The fact is, if we do what we've always done, an obvious statement, we get what we've always got or indeed less. We cannot, as I said earlier, change the past. We cannot, cannot change the past, but we can influence the future. We can change what happens in the future. The key to individual practice success is about differentiation, that word that's so often used today, but it is. And think for a moment, what does differentiation mean to you in your practice today. How do you differentiate from other practices locally? What do you do? What's so special about you? And if you can't think of anything, then you need to come up with some ideas, I think. So what are you doing today to stimulate business that others are not doing? What are you offering patients and pros prospects they can't get elsewhere? So what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you communicating to your patients and prospective <coughs> patients that really, really makes a difference? I think we need to create a clear and congruent brand. I said earlier that your everything that goes on in your practice, everything you say, everything you do, everything you communicate is your brand. We need to be clear about who we are, what we are, what we're aspiring to be and how we present that to our audience. We can't be all things to all men. I, I, don't, I just don't run with this idea that you know, a practice says, when I ask them the question, so who, who is your target audience? Who is, well, everyone. Everyone's target audience. I don't believe that. I believe a successful practice does have a target audience. That doesn't mean you dismiss uh, people if they want to come in and see you. Of course you don't, but you do need to focus on a target audience. Invest in all forms of technology. Now, not everyone can afford to buy the latest OCT, but you know, if you do invest in equipment like OCT and you find out how to maximise its opportunities, it need not cost you anything. And for those of you here this evening who've got OCT, you know what I mean. It need not be a burden, it need not be a cost, it's an investment in the future of your business. 
Be price competitive, but don't compete on price. It's about value for money. Everyone's perception of value is different. It's about value for money. Someone can spend £700 with you on a dispense and walk out feeling great. They've, they've got a fabulous pair of specs. Someone can spend 80 quid and think they've been ripped off. It's about value for money. It's about how we package that, how we deliver that service. Create phenomenal customer experience, and I do see it all the time when I'm visiting Sitecare members. Phenomenal. The staff are wonderful. Most Sitecare member practices have great staff. But you know, you can't keep doing same old, same old. You can't keep doing the same old stuff. We've got to evolve that customer care experience. And the only way you learn about that is by attending meetings like this and talking to other practitioners. Work smart at promotion. Really think about what is it that we need to do? How can we get maximum return on our investment? And invest now in digital marketing. I said this three times this evening. You, you must get involved in this stuff. You can't ignore it. And if you ignore it, you're probably ignoring it because you don't yet understand it. And there are experts who can help you. Monitor finances, campaigns and patient satisfaction. You've got to find the time to do this stuff. Half day, one day a week, <clears throat> working on the kind of stuff we're talking about. And I don't mean just general admin, but working on planning and executing. This is what you've got to do, whether you like it or not, I'm afraid. And if you don't do it, is there someone in your practice that can do it for you or help you do it? That's the thing. You don't have to do it on your own. Do we underestimate the value and importance of the practice team? How many people here this evening form a part of the practice team? And I don't mean the owners, because of course they do, but who is in the practice team? A few hands going up. OK. Well, you're doing a great job, I have to say. I, when I go around and visit practices and I see how well you operate and how you contribute to the practice, it's really, really sterling stuff. And the Warwick Business School did a survey in 2009. Admittedly, it's a bit dated, but it's still very relevant. And see if you agree with this. What they said is, what do staff want? And this is general businesses, not just practices. A fair financial reward for their efforts, not to be overmanaged, a flexible but disciplined approach to rules and procedures, trusted to make the right decisions, challenges that stretch one's ability. One wants to be stretched from time to time. A genuinely committed and caring boss working with like-minded people, management by appreciation, to be treated fairly and respectfully, given the opportunity to contribute ideas. Is that true? So in a way, it's not easy, I don't think, for practice teams. It's really not easy. Because in a commercial environment, you can't be too timid. But you can't be too pushy. You can't be overconfident. You can't be too persistent. You can't be distracted. If someone walks through the door, you've got to pay them attention. You can't not pay them attention. You can't be too attentive, overzealous, insincere, dismissive, too busy, too, too unknowledgeable, too knowledgeable. You can't be somewhere else. So what must you be? Well, you must be welcoming, friendly, sincere, attentive, confident, engaging, responsive, supportive, fluent, understanding, helpful, knowledgeable. People, people think this is easy. Practice owners think this is easy stuff. They come in every day, the optometrist, and they... They float into their consulting rooms and they just make the assumption that the staff just get on with it. They just do their job. Well, I tell you, that's a big mistake. You've got to work with teams. You've got to motivate teams. You've got to keep them happy. As I say here, having a team of people that love, that's the word, love dealing with patients. And they're not easy people, patients. Do we love patients? Not all the time we don't love them. But we know they're always right, don't we? We know they're always right. They work with harmony, with common objectives, something that takes time and needs to be nurtured. Training, motivation, leadership, teamwork. That's teamwork. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I saw that. I thought, well, it looks a bit rude. I don't know if I should put it up or not, but I, I, I chose to. So a true leader is one who makes you want to work hard, then makes you feel good because you did. That's a true leader. Now, I want to spend the next two hours talking about the success factors of <laughs> dynamic teamwork. So we start here with a tip. No, we'll do that another day. So 10 key drivers that will influence the long-term success of the independent business model. In my view, anticipate, create and embrace change. Anticipate is the word there. Anticipate change. What is going on in your local community? What is going on? How can you dovetail with what's going on in your community? 
Make the time for the management staff. Do you really, genuinely give up enough time? Or do you think, I can't afford to do that, I need to be seeing patients all the time? Prepare and work business plans and budgets. I can't labour that one enough. Establish and measure KPIs, key performance indicators. Know and review your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Know and regularly review your competition. How often do you go and see what your competition are doing and find out what they're good at and, importantly, what they're not good at? Invest in technology and aesthetics. And I say aesthetics, I mean, what does your practice look like? When was the last time you stood across the road and looked at it and thought, I love the look of my practice, I love that business? Or do you sit, stand there and think, I'm not really sure about this, it doesn't look great, it does need a lick of paint, it needs a new bit of signage. Oh, I'll look at that next week. It really needs to look fabulous. It doesn't matter where you are in the country, it needs to look fabulous. Invest in te technology, set out and establish to nurture your brand, invest in people, 1% of turnover I think should be spent on training, motivation, leadership stuff. And as I said, 8%, plus 8% on all this marketing stuff. So at this point, let me just remind you of what Sitecare does. Now, our mission statement, to promote the values and ethos of independent practices in local communities, providing the commercial knowledge, products and relevant business skills for members to compete effectively in the UK optical market, ensuring consumers have real purchasing choice long term. That's very, very important. Do we want everyone to go to Specsavers? Of course, we don't. Now, we have a director, Gary, in the audience this evening, and if I ask Gary what does he think of that mission statement, he'll say, well, I don't remember approving that, Paul. And he's right. The board have not approved that mission statement. That's something I've created. Maybe at the next board meeting I'll get them to sign off on it. But anyway, that's what I think we're all about. But benefit-wise, and I'm not going to go through this in, these in any particular detail, but this is the kind of stuff that we can help you with, all of this stuff here. So if you need any help in all of that, or any of that, then we're here to help you. And I do believe the future prosperity of the independent sector does rest in your hands and your ability to respond to change, with Sitecare's help, of course. And as I said earlier, change is the only constant in life. It is the only constant in life. And as a Sitecare member, you have all this to access, this great resource to access. And I do believe, I do believe the independent sector needs critical mass. We don't want it to shrink any further. And I think every independent has a responsibility of encouraging other independents who are not up to speed to get up to speed. Encourage them to come to meetings like this, where you can listen to the great presenters that you're going to hear uh, after me. Spread the word that we're here to help encourage people to join us. So thank you. That's the um, email address if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoints for this evening. So thank you for your time. I much appreciate it.